Well, this is the day that our God has made. And if you are excited about that, let us rejoice and let us be glad in it. Oh, magnify our God with me. We shall praise our God. As long as we have breath in our body, we will praise our creator. Welcome to this chapel worship experience. We are so, so glad that you are here. This month marks a new theme, which is reimagining faith, God, and self, which means that we know that God is faithful. We know that. But then God also has faith in you and me, faith that we will live into our potential, faith that we will be the people that God has called us to be, faith that we will be leaders out in the world who do justice work, who heal this world. So as God has faith in us, then we must also have faith in ourselves and our ability to be, and we can leave that open to be, because it is whatever you have been called to be. So all month long, we'll be diving into this theme and imagining ways that we can reimagine faith, faith in God, but faith in ourselves. Today is very special because we have worshiping with us and preaching for the first time in this space, our new president of Bright Divinity School, the Reverend Dr. Stephen Cady. We have to just be in awe of God and everything that God is doing here at Bright. Just seeing Dr. Katie sitting here is a reminder that God is still doing a new thing and that we ought to rejoice and co-create along with God in everything that God is doing. So I hope that in this hour on today, you'll be opened and you'll be inspired to think about faith in a new way and you'll be inspired to enjoy worship. Feel free to stand, to sing, to dance. Whatever you want to do in this space is welcome. And again, welcome to this chapel worship experience. We are so glad that you are here. Please stand and sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
let us pray. Holy wisdom, font of truth and discerner of justice, as you have sent your spirit on prophets and teachers, judges and ministers in generations past, so we ask you today to send your spirit upon our new president, Stephen, and upon all who lead at this institution, that we might continue to be faithful in our quest for scholarship, justice, and practice at Bright Divinity School, and that we might always be open to where the paths of scholarship, justice, and practice may lead us. We ask this in the name of the one who binds us together and who gives us hope. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Having read upon and engage Stephen Cady, uh, the second, <laughs> in person, there is much that is impressive about him. Yet there is nothing strange if the anticipation of his arrival and presence among us have generated some degree of anxiety. After all, most of us have served Bright during the long tenure of one president, Noel Williams, and have helped to shape a particular ethos, structured our professional and personal lives under the influence of that ethos, and generated desires for Bright and hopes for ourselves in response to the dynamics of that long period. In relation to this scenario, Stephen Cady's presence will be strange and unnerving because he's a brand new element in what appeared to be a settled equation. As such, I'm sure questions such as, why him? Will he? Should he? Will continue to exercise some minds for a while. With this background, my suggestions on how to dispose ourselves for the new presidency and toward the new president are influenced by both pragmatic and idealistic considerations and are guided by the view that in every point of decision making, we must bear in mind both stubborn facts and the possibilities for creative advance. And friends, the most obvious stubborn fact is that Stephen Cady is here, and he is our president. A professional search firm and responsible persons from among us spent countless hours of their valuable time in scrutiny of numerous excellent prospects and were influenced in their final decision by the evaluations made by some of us in the chapel today. As such, an important pragmatic stance in response to this stubborn fact is acceptance that, as persons who value the opportunity to work at a theological institution, which is still viable and able to support our pursuits and ambitions we need to commit ourselves to learn how to work with our new leader, to ensure continued and increased institutional flourishing from which all of us together will benefit. One of the admonitions I have given to colleagues from the earliest period of the search is that whoever becomes our president, they need to arrive at Bright and find us working. Now that a president is in place, we need to learn as much as possible about him. We need to watch carefully, listen discerningly, engage directly, and be as respectfully honest 
as we can possibly be. And we need to allow these to affect the way we work individually and corporatively. And having done all of that, we need to be prepared to be surprised. We will be surprised because we can never have certain and exhaustive knowledge of a person from the outside because of what they look like, how they talk, the age they may appear to be, even the route they took to get to us. As such, with our knowledge of Bright, generated over years of association with it, the initial perceptions we have of our new leader and the recommendations we intend to give him need to be accompanied by a great deal of humility. Humility born from the acceptance that we are all finite, frail, fractured entities whose astute discernments are invariably affected by our ignorance, our prejudices, and our fears. And exactly because we've been immersed in this context, even jaded by it, a new, fresh perspective is vital. Also expect to be surprised, because in part, it is the circumstances that unfold in the next days, weeks, months, years, as we continue to give our best efforts and work in critical solidarity with our present president, and as he responds to what he experiences of us and among us, that some aspects of who he is will become manifested to, to us and even to himself. Yet beyond these, we should expect to be surprised because life, the dynamics of existence in which we all participate, always has surprises waiting for us. We at Bright have a noble vision of a world transformed by God's love, mercy, and justice. And we sometimes think we know exactly how, by what route, and under what kind of leadership this can properly occur. However, if it is God's love, mercy, and justice, let's be open to learn from God about how these should be manifested in the period ahead under the leadership of Steve, Stephen Cady. From a God who had to remind Israel and reminds us today, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So friends, colleagues, comrades all, if we have not already adopted a posture of open expectancy, I invite us to start performing our way to it today. And to have the words of the Apostle Paul ringing into our spirits, eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, nor have entered in the hearts of human beings the things that God has prepared for those of us who love him and who love God and are prepared to work in cooperation with our leader with open expectancy of what God has in store for us and is ready to manifest in our midst. Thank you. stand forgive me jesus in the morning when i rise in the morning when i rise in the morning when i rise give me jesus give Thank you. 
Just before the break of day, just before the break of day, just before the break of day, give me Jesus, give me Genesis 28, 10 through 19. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a stairway set up on the earth the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Creator stood beside him and said, I am God, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, Surely the Creator is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. Amen, amen. Well, it is my joy to present to you our preacher for today. The Reverend Stephen Katie, Ph.D. Dr. Katie previously served as the senior minister of Asbury First United Methodist Church in Rochester, New York. The congregation known for social justice, anti-poverty efforts, and LGBTQIA advocacy flourished during Katie's tenure. 
During his time there, the congregation increased worshiping attendance and grew its endowment from six million to over 10 million while reducing the annual endowment draw. And they completed the largest capital campaign in its history, raising more than $8 million to renovate, expand, and transform a, a historic building into a fully accessible community outreach center. So with that, you know, I, I'm, I'm hearing the $8 million and I'm, and I'm thinking, okay, Bright, we got some money coming in because we got Dr. Katie and he's gonna continue fundraising right on here in Fort Worth. Thank God for Dr. Katie. <laughs> Dr. Katie earned his Doctor of Philosophy at Princeton Theological Seminary and a Master of Divinity at Garrett, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. He earned a Bachelor of Arts at Ohio Wesleyan University. Bright Divinity School community, let us receive and welcome our preacher, our president, the Reverend Dr. Stephen Cady. I want to say a special thank you for the warm welcome that I have received, not just here today, but over the course of the last few days and the last few weeks at Ministry Week. Thank you to the search committee, the trustees, the students, the faculty, the staff. What a gift it is to be with you and among you. I want to point out something about the introduction that was given. While I am proud of the work that we did to raise funds at Asbury First, it wasn't for nothing. We don't raise funds just to raise funds. We raise them for the mission that has been set before us. And we recognize that Rochester, New York, had one of the highest concentrations of poverty in the nation, and we wanted to do something about it. And so we began as a congregation to cast a vision to change some of that. And we were proud of what we did. So while I am proud of the funds raised, I am much more proud of the work that we have done to try and alleviate poverty in Rochester, New York. I also want to say the questions that were raised by the dean. Why me? Will I? And should I? Why me? To be honest, I'm still trying to figure that out. But I know and I have felt the work of the Spirit in this since the very beginning. Will I? Maybe. And should I? Probably. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. And Jacob dreamed there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of which reached to heaven, and messengers of God were ascending and descending on it. And Jacob dreamed there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of which reached to heaven, and there were messengers of God ascending and descending on it. And Jacob dreamed there was a ladder. Before we figured out the wheel, before we rubbed two sticks together long enough to spark a flame, before we lived indoors, wore clothing, or finally understood each other's grunts, <laughs> before any of it, we dreamed. From the very beginning, like the very beginning, we as human beings have dreamed. And it starts really early. Doctors discovered the REM cycle by studying infants. There's even evidence that it begins in utero. That is, before we're even born, certainly before we learn to speak, we dream. 
The question is, why? The short answer, of course, is we don't know. Scientists, philosophers, theologians all have slightly different responses. Some think it's just the way that our psyche works out our fears and fantasies. Others think it's God's way of speaking to us. Others just chalk it up to gas. But the truth of it is, after all of the research we've done over years and centuries, we don't know. We don't know why we dream. But we do know this. The world would be a different place if we didn't. Because whatever else it does, dreaming affords us the opportunity to imagine a world that is different than our own, doesn't it? And make no mistake, we long for a world that is different than our own, don't we? A world in which it is not just people who look like me or love like me or happen to have the same gender as me who are able to get ahead. A world in which, as we just discovered in Oklahoma, a trans teen finds respite, not rebuke, from their church, their school, and their family. A world in which we were reminded, as we were reminded during ministry week, that 13 people don't hold more wealth than the bottom 50% in our world. A world in which no immigrant is treated as an alien. A world in which we take seriously the damage being done to our planet. A world in which the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, is held in at least as high regard as the second amendment. But if we are going to get to that world, it is going to take people like us, people like you, like me, who are willing to dream, to see things not just as they are, but as they could be, which of course is our bread and butter. After all, what is the gospel if not the promise that what is, is not what has to be? What is, is not what has to be. Things can, things should change. So, Bright Divinity School, what do you dream? Jacob dreamed there was a ladder set up on earth, the top of which reached to heaven, and there were angels, messengers of God, ascending and descending on it. Of what do we dream? See, this is an institution that has a long history of dreaming, of not settling for things as they are, but dreaming about what they could be. We have not done it perfectly. Who does? But we have done our best to try and see what could be and then educate and inspire people to go out and change the world for the better. We can even hear the dream in our vision that is a world transformed by God's love, mercy, and justice. What is that if not a dream? And I am honored and humbled and, to be honest, a little terrified to be a part of it. But I give thanks to God that I am not in this alone. We are not in this alone. This is my second day on the job. So far, so good. <laughs> and I pray I've not messed things up too much so far. And there will be moments, undoubtedly, when I stumble. But two days is enough to recognize that this is a special community. I've already met students who are ready and poised to change this world for the better. I've met faculty who are trying to help us understand what it means to be human. I've met a staff that every day shows up longing for nothing more than to make the mission of this place possible. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that? But I also recognize that just outside of these doors is an entire world filled with people who are longing for a little meaning and belonging and radical hospitality, who know deep down intrinsically that there is something not right in this world and don't know where to search don't know where to find the answers. We have something to offer this world, but we have to kind of get past ourselves in order to share it. Look, the challenge of the academy, not just here, anywhere, is the challenge of navel-gazing. That is, we can spend so much time looking in the mirror that we forget to look out the window. 
To be clear, it is important to look in the mirror to recognize the ways that we are participating in those systems and structures that are making it impossible for others in this world to live abundantly, to flourish in life. All of us, especially people who look like me, have to look in the mirror and confront the ways that we are participating in the systems and structures of white supremacy. But we cannot stay looking in the mirror. At some point, we have to turn out and change the way we're living in this world. That is the gift, the privilege of education, is that eventually we have to share it. That's the other side of the bargain. We have to share what it is that we are learning here with the people we encounter in this world. As Howard Thurman said, when I go deep enough inside myself, I come up inside all other people. If we are going to spend a moment in introspection, it has to lead us out of these doors and into the world. We're going to have to share what it is that we're learning and understanding and being. Because the truth is, we have a mission at Bright to educate and inspire people to serve God's diverse world as leaders in the church, academy, and public life. But all of us have a much larger mission than that. It's the one that founds the Judeo-Christian tradition. It is simply this, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And if we can't do that here, then what business do we have going out into the world and trying to share that with others? That is our primary call to love one another. We have to practice it here so that we can then go and live it in the world, teach others to do the same. But it starts right here, one relationship at a time. When I called a friend and told him that I was leaving my local congregation, which I loved so much, to step into the academy, he said, I'm sorry, you're leaving the church. And if I had been wiser in the moment, I would have told him, I'm not. This is the church. Maybe you remember it. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. We are the church. Sure, not everybody here is going to go out and serve in pastoral ministry, but every single one, if you're trying to love God and love neighbor as yourself, is going to serve the church. And we ought to remember that. Everybody keeps asking me what my vision is for Bright Divinity School, and I want to say, who cares? Because the truth is, my vision is whatever our vision is going to be. It's whatever we are willing to dream together. The whole point of my role is to shepherd your dream, is to figure out together who God is calling us to be, and then find the resources and find the systems and structures we need to put in place in order to make that happen. Do I have ideas? Yes. But I want to listen to what it is that your ideas are so that we can find our way together. Who cares what my dream is? What is our dream together? One thing I've already heard is that we need to work on the way that we communicate with one another. Every institution in the world struggles with communication. Every consultant who's ever gone into a place, always the first thing that they write is, I think you need to work on communication. Duh. But we can do it. So long as we are grounding ourselves in love. Because communication without love leads to mistrust. Maybe you know the story of the young woman who began in her first congregation, and she goes up and she struggles to read her manuscript. She squints, looking at the bulletin, and finally she decides at the end of the service to be a little bold. So she stands at the front of the chancel and she says to the community, you know, I I know I'm not supposed to do this, it's a little unorthodox, but I want to share with you a dream that I have for this congregation. I dream that we get a new chandelier. And there was some head nodding around in the sanctuary, but in the back, as there almost always is, there was a man who stood up red in the face, and he said, I'm against it. I'm against that chandelier for three reasons. Number one, nobody here knows how to spell it. Number two, nobody here knows how to play it. And number three, what we really need is more light. (laughs) Communication not grounded in love leads to mistrust, and we can be better. We ought to be better. Because we are a community who believes that what is, is not what has to be. Jacob's dream didn't pop up overnight. 
You don't have to have taken a class in the First Testament to recognize that Jacob was sort of a jerk. He had not been living the way that God had called him to live. And then he dreamed. In some ways, that dream was a reminder to him that how he had been living was not how he had been called to live. It was a reminder that he may have gained his birthright and a blessing, but it had cost him his soul, his brother, his relationship. And now, in this moment, he finds himself lost in the desert, all alone, with nothing but a rock for a pillow. Maybe some of us have been there. Maybe some of us are there. Jacob's dream was a reminder that he was not stuck. The good news, friends, is that neither are we. Look, I don't know everything that has happened to get to this moment in Bright's history. I'm going to do my very best to learn as much as I can to honor the traditions that have come before, but also to look forward. Say, I can't change what has happened in the past because I can't but I can do my very best to fumble my way forward. That is, to do my best to listen, to love, to love alongside you, to dream with you about who we are and who God is calling to be, because the same promise God made to Jacob, God makes to us. That is, I will not leave you alone. That I will be with you no matter what happens, no matter where you are, no matter what may come. And once we have that freedom, then... Why not try? Look, Jacob's dream could have just been indigestion. Maybe that mess of pottage wasn't sitting well with them. Some of us have been there. But in the end, does it matter? Because the truth is, in the end, the difference between a dream that falls flat and one that changes the world is our willingness to embrace it. Jacob dreamed there was a ladder set up on the earth, stretching into heaven. And messengers of God were ascending and descending on it. What bright divinity school do we dream? May it be so. Amen. Stand and sing Blessed Assurance with me and take note of the new text.
Built into the Christian faith, we have a moment to reconcile ourselves to one another. A chance to say what has happened in the past has happened, and now we are going to commit moving forward to find our way together. Communion is only the only sacrament that we repeat, at least in most parts of the Christian church. We don't have to take it. But if we do, it is our opportunity to step back into relationship with one another. The chalice and the patent used today were made for me by my colleague in ministry when we graduated seminary, and she gave them to me on the day we graduated. So often in moments when I'm a little anxious or nervous or hopeful or just beginning something new, I will use these in order to remind myself that I'm not in this alone. And neither are you. So we remember the moment in which Jesus gathered with his friends, his colleagues in ministry, and at some point he took a loaf of bread. He gave thanks to God. And then he broke the bread. And in the brokenness, in the brokenness, he said, this is my body which is given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took a cup, and again he gave thanks to God, and again he gave it to his friends, and he said, drink from this, all of you, all of you, all of you, for this is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves, that's all we actually have to give ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. We pray not so much that the bread or the cup will be transformed, but that we might, through this moment of genuine communion, one soul to another. So we pray that the Holy Spirit might be poured out on these gifts, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the body and blood of Christ for this broken world. Make them be for us a reminder of the covenant you have made to never leave us alone. Help us in taking communion to imagine a ladder, a literal connection between the world as it is and as it could be and in bringing that dream to life one relationship at a time. Amen. We'll take communion if it's okay, and I don't know how it's normally done, so I guess I'm messing up on my own here, but I'd love to just have everybody hold on to the elements and sit down so that we can take everything together. Is that okay? So I think, and do Ole. You don't have to come, but if you do, I pray that you take with the commitment that is being made.
invite you to take the wafer and remind you that this, this is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. This, my friends, is the cup of forgiveness freely given. Take and drink. Amen. This last song is a new song to me. You may know it or maybe you don't, but um, I really 
like the text. I don't always um, connect with contemporary Christian music, to be honest, but this piece is um, meaningful to me, so I hope it is to you too. It's called Freedom. If you'll stand and try it with me. And if you know it already, sing out. Help us. <clears throat> Step out of the shadows, step out of the grave, break into the wild, and don't be afraid, run into wide open spaces, grace is waiting for you, dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting where the Spirit of God is. There is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark just as you are into the fullness of God's love for the Spirit. Bring all of your burdens, bring all of your scars. Come back to communion, come back to the star. Run into wide open spaces, grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting where the Spirit of God is. There is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark just as you are into the fullness of God's love for the Spirit. I think we did pretty well. Good job, y'all. Um, there is freedom. Let's celebrate the musical talents in this space on today. <laughs> Minister Emily Davis. And Mr. Larry Willis. Let us rejoice and be glad in the sermon, the spoken word of today. Let us celebrate our new president, the Reverend Dr. Stephen Cady. We hope that you'll continue celebrating in um, community conversation, which will follow worship on today. We are going to have some great lunch, and then we are going to pick Dr. Katie's brain. We're going to have a Q&A um, conversation with him. So I hope that you'll join us and you'll um, be brave and, and ask all the questions that you have burning in your hearts right now. And so we'll be doing that right after worship concludes in Bass Conference Center. 
I also want to remind you that today is uh, the day to vote. If you did not participate in early voting, please make sure that you make it to the polls today. And just to let you know, in case you have not heard, one of our students is actually seeking office, Patrick Moses. If you want to hear more about him and the work that he is hoping to do for, for uh, Tarrant County, please visit MosesForSheriff.com. All right, well, I'm feeling good about today. I've had such a good time worshiping with all of you. I hope that you have been inspired by the word and that you've been inspired by this theme of reimagining faith, God and self. If you believe in yourself the way that God does, what would be possible? What new things would you do? What new ways would you show up in this world? So let us together go forth and do that. Now unto you, O God, who's able to keep us from falling and present us faultless in your presence. To the one and only wise, majestic God, all the dominion and power forever. Amen. <laughs>